Welcome back to the Worst Publisher 2022. Our quest to see out of all the publishers who's uh, who's done the best, who's done the worst. And today it's going to be Ubisoft. And man, does this start a bit bizarrely when we take a look at uh, the games that they've released. Because a lot of these I don't think you'll know about because Ubisoft released them and then didn't support them. It's weird. Okay, Clash of Beasts, a mobile game from Ubisoft Abu Dhabi, not rated on any of the rating platforms. I don't really think anyone knows about it. We've of course got Rainbow Six Extraction, not a particularly great game, but something that I suppose at least had a bit of a home on Game Pass, but ultimately a game that was, I would say, a pretty damn protracted disappointment. And that is especially noteworthy considering this game was itself delayed many, many times. Weird. We've got Trivial Pursuit Live 2. Moving on, we've got Roller Champions. Again, this is weird. It has a pretty damn low number of reviews. Really seems to have floundered uh, on launch. It just got added to Steam, but overall, uh, feels like a bit of a bit of a squib. We do have Discovery Tour Viking Age, which is the thing that they do their historical tour DLC for uh, for Assassin's Creed. It is what it is. You'll know if you want it, but I think we could all agree that while it's actually a really cool thing for them to be doing, it's not going to be massive for them, I guess. As a, as a big games publisher. We then have got Rabid, Party of Legends, which barely anyone heard about, came out on a bunch of platforms, but uh, was just a port of a China-only party game with four reviews in Metacritic, and I don't think anybody knows about it. Similar to, and I mean, I don't know if you've been excited about this one, but Wild Arena Survivors? Yeah came out in August. It was designed as a mobile battle royale in the Far Cry setting, but it's weird because it was launched without that branding, and then it kind of like failed to penetrate. Nothing was followed up on there. Again, it's like, why did you do this? We then have one of the most bizarre moves I've seen. Rocksmith Plus. This came out in September for Windows and Mobile. You might be thinking, what? Rocksmith Mobile? That makes no sense. Yeah, because it's not like the video game Rocksmith. It's a learn how to play the guitar subscription service. Yeah. So they've kind of taken something that was already a little bit niche and then made it even more niche and pretty expensive. Again, that's weird. Now, we then, of course, do have an actual good hit, which is Mario plus Rabbids Spark of Hope. This, broadly speaking, was very well received across the board. It's available on Switch. People seem happy at the Game Awards. It did get uh, Best Sim Strategy Game. Yeah, okay, good stuff. Mario plus Rabbids is actually a really killer series. I would recommend it. And then, of course, Just Dance 2023 edition, because yes, that has to happen. Now, what's a bit bizarre is that uh, they've seemingly just pulled marketing from a whole bunch of this stuff. I haven't really talked about it, haven't made much noise. And that is what's bizarre. It really seems that Ubisoft is floundering. And really, to be more protracted than that, we've got to talk about their delays. The Sattler Saga. Oh boy. So The Sattlers was supposed to be a spiritual reboot that was supposed to come out in 2019. But then it was moved to Q3 2020. And then, well, it was kind of seemingly cancelled. Pre-orders were refunded. So that project, obviously went to shit. Then, in January of 2022, they actually claimed the game would be coming out in March. A closed beta happened, and seemingly Ubisoft were so deluded about the game's quality that, uh, well, they realized the feedback was actually so bad that they had to uh, delay the game and not provide a new release date. But then, November 2022, it was re-announced as The Settlers' New Allies for release in February of 2023. That's next month! It's gonna come out on PC, Switch, uh, PlayStation consoles, Xbox, Xbox consoles, GeForce Now, Luna, maybe, because, man, not a good history here. And to be honest with you, I would expect that this is a game that has probably been rebooted multiple times. I have a feeling that they are just going to be putting out a minimum viable product for this launch, and overall, I don't expect anything from it, which is a shame because it should be up my alley. We then have Skull and Bones! Skull and Bones! What do we even have to say about this one? It's been a enduring shit show for the company, sinking a humongous quantity of money, slurping up lots of incentives from <laughs> from the government of Singapore. This was heavily rumored, talked about, leaked, there were studio reports. Then, 
We found out it would come out November 8th, 2022. And then we found out in September that it would come out March 9th, 2023. So kind of insane. This was a four month delay to a game that already had, uh, well, I think an average of one delay a year for five years that is currently being worked on by four studios. There was the July uh, presentation of gameplay, which initially, of course, leaked. And my God, did it look drab. So ultimately, no, stonks are certainly down for Skull and Bones. We then have got Frontier her Avatar, Frontiers of Pandora, which perhaps interest will be a bit reignited based on the new movie coming out and that they're reportedly will be like pretty damn good follow-up of Avatar movies. So yeah, this game was scheduled, um, they said, in a 2021 investor call between April 22 and March 23, which kind of would make sense to tie in with Avatar The Way of Water, right? Now, this is an entirely standalone game, but you think, oh, rising in the movie's hype. But in another investor call in 2022, they moved it to 2023, 2024 in order to make it perfect. Now, this is made, I believe, in the Snowdrop engine, the most advanced iteration of it. That engine can pull off some cool stuff. And uh, I'm actually, I'm pretty sure this will at the very least look the part. What will it be as a game? Who really knows? Again, we hear in order to make it perfect. Sometimes that's putting the cherry on top. Sometimes that's getting something you can release after an internal reboot that happened 18 months ago and the game, you know, maybe it took eight years to develop, but the actual version that you're going to get at the end was only really made in two and, you know, another one of those situations. It's kind of hard to tell, but I think that missing out on Way of Water probably won't be the worst thing in the universe. If uh, Way of Water does actually manage to rehab the Avatar brand, get people thinking about it a little bit more, and then we have subsequent movies over years, that could actually go pretty good. Now, of course, we do have the hilarious one, which is the Prince of Persia Sands of Time remake. TLDR, um, Ubisoft Poon slash uh, Mumbai was working in this and... Uh, I mean, people basically just did not accept what they saw whenever this was uh, reve uh, revealed. This ultimately was delayed to 2021, then it was delayed indefinitely, and then it was handed over from Ubisoft uh, Mumbai slash uh, Poon uh, over to Ubisoft Montreal, which is one of their headline expensive studios, so that they could apparently rebuild upon the work. So who knows, maybe they've decided, screw it, we'll make this a Capcom tier uh, game, or maybe they are just really struggling. And to be honest, given Ubisoft's general uh, situation the last while, I honestly think it's just them struggling. What about their notable ongoing titles, though? Well, this is actually where Ubisoft does see quite a bit more success. Assassin's Creed Valhalla has actually been, like, one of those live-service single-player games that has delivered loads of content. While it maybe isn't for everybody, it certainly has found an audience. It's done spectacularly well. Recently, the Forgotten Saga added a whole roguelite uh, game mode. The pay DLC Dawn of Ragnarok had 35 hours of gameplay, they say, which uh, is actually pretty awesome for a DLC. I mean, they've had big DLCs, like for the Siege of Paris, they've had a DLC of Ireland, which I think is pretty damn cool. Yeah, like fair play to them on Assassin's Creed. It's annoying that Assassin's Creed has absolutely been leading the charge in things like an XP boost or a gold boost being sold in a single player game or optional cosmetics being sold in a single player game. And we do not like those things, but damn, have they not released a hell of a lot of content to players, right? You gotta give them that. Then Far Cry 6, and boy, this one's weird. Basically, the actual game, Far Cry 6, was just more of the same. As an ongoing thing, though, it's a bit weird because of Lost Between Worlds, which uh, was announced alongside the Game of the Year edition, which is, I mean, yeah, just one of those, I guess, buy the game, you get stuff included. Um, they then advertised a unrevealed expansion pack as the main draw, but the problem is that other than you being able to buy it, you didn't really know what it was going to be. And then it suddenly dropped at the end of November, uh, basically revealing it's and it's an entirely weird different experience it's kind of insane essentially the protagonist of far cry 6 gets transported to an alien landscape where they have to fight crystal enemies in a remixed version of the main game what <laughs> I guess in the same way that Blood Dragon came out of nowhere and people liked it, they're just kind of trying to recapture that. Still, much in the same way that uh, I, I, I don't know, I like with Assassin's Creed and the way that it had gotten in the past, I feel like Far Cry maybe needs a bit of a shakeup. Now, of course, elsewhere, they do have Rainbow Six Siege, which is going great. They've got For Honor, they've got Brawlhalla, and uh, the rest of their live games are steadily adding content, and that's been the good thing. 
Now, for a summary of their big news in 2022, obviously there are some closures, right? Uh, Watch Dogs Legion had no more updates after it met its initial roadmap requirements. The game just didn't do well enough, I guess. We've got Hyperscape that was shut down in April. It just never found an audience. Then Splinter Cell VR was canceled. Ghost Recon Frontlines, which was basically an, ex an extraction battle royale, that was cancelled. Two further unannounced projects were also cancelled. Uh, we then found out, of course, the decommissioning of a bunch of online services, including DLCs, for 15 titles in, uh, in December. That had uh, quite a lot of uh, controversy. Ubisoft mains, though, did actually step up to um, basically just devote some resources to keeping Anno 2070 um, online good. So that was really nice to see. The other thing then, of course, is just the story of NFTs, right? We cannot not talk about this. Essentially, it was kind of awkward whenever their VP of uh, Strategic Innovations Lab and their blockchain uh, technical director told us that gamers don't get what a digital secondary market can bring them. In one way, you could talk about, oh, wow, a great economic system of growth. For a lot of players, though, it's just going to be a play to earn hellscape. And their initial offering within Ghost Recon Breakpoint was really kind of embarrassing through their platform, Ubisoft Quartz, which just nobody really partook in. It was really pretty damn dumb. But where it goes, though, is uh, really Ubisoft probably still working in this. Uh, they haven't put anything more in their games, but they have partnered with Oasis, who are also working with Square Enix and other major players in the gaming space. So, hmm, Ubisoft Quartz, dad for now. Could something happen? Yeah, probably, or at least they're looking into it. Now, we've also got corporate bullshit. Yes. So we've got uh, about the closest thing they had to a win this year, which was a labor union confirming that Ubisoft's Singapore office has adequate structural systems in place to appropriately handle uh, workplace uh, complaints, right? So that all happened. It happened following a uh, Kotaku investigation. Ultimately, then, did come decently aside to the company, so that was a bit of a win. But otherwise, we have had the whole uh, the activist uh, group at Better Ubisoft. They actually confirmed that none of the requirements have been met and that 25% uh, of the original signatories had left the company with 39% uh, of those identifying as women. So they're sort of saying, okay, in this group, which disproportionately uh, includes uh, women, that they are failing to meet their demands. Obviously, though, Ubisoft do not feel that this group is particularly important. Otherwise, they maybe would have done something about it. Uh, but clearly, they do feel that they can pretty much just ignore them or maybe try... Some of the ways that a company may try to strong arm out who they would consider to be problem employees, because ultimately this uh, large attrition rate to Ubisoft, that's probably a good thing, right? They would probably see the signatories of that and think, ah, well, these are the people who are the least tied to us. Let's replace them without giving into any of their demands and just fill more staff. The question, though, is will that strategy work because the labor market in games can be pretty tight? Now, I've heard that be talked about in the Californian context, Obviously, when we look to places like Montreal, well, that is another major games hub with quite a lot of studios, so maybe it's still pretty hard to uh, to get people in, especially when you have bad PR. So who knows on that one? Of course, though, acquisitions are another part of the gaming space, the sort of thing we got to talk about now. And uh, essentially, I, there's quite a lot here. Tencent invested with uh, Gilmo Brothers Limited, which is the company through which the Gilmo family uh, exercise their control of Ubisoft. Basically, overall, they the, the Yves Gilmo, who's their CEO, and the, the that family, who are basically the family that own Ubisoft, um, they made moves along with Tencent coming in to help with the finances that would essentially just ensure that they you know won't kind of have a hostile acquisition happen. Right? They just solidified their position as uh, as leaders in the company without having to give up uh, any particularly firm uh, control. And then obviously they've also gained a decent corporate ally in Tencent. Of course, will Tencent impact them? I mean, yes, probably. But uh, at the very least, from the sorts of things that they seemingly were worried about, this was their way out and their position is more solid now.
As for a few miscellaneous things then, there are Ubisoft games that came back to Steam, like Assassin's Creed Odyssey, uh, Roller Champions, Anno 1800, Scott Pilgrim, The Division 2, they want to add more games there. Uh, also, they unveiled Assassin's Creed Infinity, which is something between a launcher and a hub for the series. But anyway, the plan is that all things Assassin's Creed will exist under this Infinity banner. Now, that does include the projects that we know about, which are Red, which is a, uh, well, it's an Assassin's Creed game, open world style in the same vein as the last three games, and set in Japan, which, uh, hey, a lot of people are more interested in that sort of idea after Ghost of, Sush uh, Ghost of Tsushima, so maybe we'll see a novel take on that. I mean, certainly the Ubisoft games are pretty good for just having a romp in a cool setting. There's also Hex, which is a non-RPG seemingly set in Central Europe at the time of the witch hunts, which honestly seems really cool to me. And then there's Invictus, which is uh, basically them trying to resurrect some of the multiplayer that people enjoyed with the Ezio series, which is actually pretty good because those Ezio like multiplayer games were, uh, they were actually really cool. You know, I, I mean, hey, social stealth, it, it kind of came on uh, quite a bit, right? Among Us, obviously. Uh, and all of that. Of course, there are games that have been in that vein for a long time, and uh, th those were really awesome back in the day. So it's nice to see that uh, that happen. But okay, let's talk about 2023 incoming, where we do have uh, things. So we've got Oddballers, which is developed by GameSwing and supported by Ubisoft uh, Mumbai slash Boom. It's a bombastic dodgeball-inspired multiplayer uh, party game. Comes out January 26th on Luna, PC, and Xbox consoles. Of course, though, is this just going to be another Roller Champions, right? What if it doesn't catch on? Will they pull marketing? I wonder. Now, there's Valiant Hearts Coming Home, which is, uh, of course, a sequel. Uh, what's cool this time, though, is, uh, well, one thing, it's in partnership with Netflix Games, so I'll be interested to see distribution of that over time, but it is made by Ubisoft Montpellier, who made uh, Old Skull and, uh, of course, Valiant Hearts, which uh, I, I really enjoyed. I thought it was great to see then that this is depicting the Harlem Hellfighters. I mean, that's a really really cool story from the first african-american um, infantry unit that fought in world war one uh just the history of that unit is uh, is really fascinating so shining a light in that history i mean that's awesome i love it when games can inspire our curiosity now for a game that isn't doing that there is skull and bones i mean in a way it could because piracy in the indian ocean is kind of not where people's minds first go even though that is a very rich and fascinating uh, you know, cultural time, I'm sure. I just don't really think that Skull and Bones seems to be the game to do that based on uh, how they've showed it off, where, you know, <laughs> you can live a pirate fantasy as long as it doesn't involve boarding actions, sword fighting, or doing anything other than controlling a ship or navigating a menu uh, that is shaped like a 3D island. It'll probably come out March 9th. We've got Mighty Quest 2, so apparently Mighty Quest for Epic Loot did well enough that Netflix were willing to fund a sequel for their platform, so hack and slash roguelite 2023. We've got, of course, Avatar Frontiers of Pandora. We've then got Assassin's Creed Mirage. Now, this is the final AC game that will happen before Infinity, and actually, it's one that I'm super down for. So there is a side story in Valhalla that was starring uh, Bashim and Roshan in 9th century Baghdad. This is a seriously fascinating point in time. It really, really is. Well, I think that's often underappreciated because people just think, ah, Crusader memes. But no, there is so much there. There's so much to that culture. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's a time period that I'm super down on. But what I really like is that it's going to be a full return to the classic stealth and parkour uh, style of, of those games. If they can nail that, then suffice to say the rumored August release date is something that I would be uh, very much looking at because I'm excited. Now, there are also the variety of half-shown free-to-play projects that we've seen. Project U, The Division Heartlands, and, uh, you know, others. But who the hell knows? It's Ubisoft. They basically get to coast off having a few really good successes and then they flounder everything else. So overall, we all know that Ubisoft can make great games sometimes. But many other times, they just seem to get led astray by things and... Kind of go nowhere fast. I mean, it's just been nothing but delays uh, for Ubisoft as long as we've covered them. And it hasn't, you know, it has been like that for most of the industry, given COVID and everything. But it seems like it really hit Ubisoft 
particularly hard. And you've got all these instances like Watch Dogs having such a good initial show off and then Watch Dogs being Watch Dogs. Watch Dogs 2, by all accounts, being a way better game than Watch Dogs, but seemingly just not selling. And then Watch Dogs Legion having a really strong showing at E3, people getting really excited. And it just isn't really good enough to have that staying power when it comes out. It's kind of interesting. It keeps on happening to Ubisoft, all while they have these big corporate problems. So as far as I'm concerned, look, Rainbow Six Siege, that's going to keep going. Wow, that's great. For Honor, a bit more of a limited audience game, but it's nice that that's sort of kept alive. You know, they do have those wins. That there is a big, historically set, uh, role-playing game series fundamentally makes me happy. I hope that Infinity ends up being a way for them to sustainably build a lot of Assassin's Creed over time, because I think that's honestly an idea, or that's a setting where games not only can just be a fun game, but also can spark young minds. Get, I mean, how many of us have found the, you know, found history to be accessible through gaming and then have went on to learn significantly more? So I think things like that are a really good thing. And when I look at Assassin's Creed, you know what? The Valhalla formula in Japan, that sounds really awesome, especially thinking about how their DLCs are so myth-inspired. I think there's a hell of a lot they could mine out there, so I'm pretty damn excited about that. There's a game set in Baghdad that's going to be more like the Assassin's Creed's of old. I'm also pretty excited about that. So it's one of those weird things. When I look at their future lineup, I'm pretty jazzed. When I take a look at a lot of their bullshit and everything outside of what I'm excited for. I mean, it does seem like a endless sort of incompetent shit show where it's like they don't really know what they want to do. They have a few IPs that they can reliably hit on, like Assassin's Creed, because they know what Assassin's Creed is. But it feels like they're just trying to replicate that success elsewhere by making these blueprint games. I mean, it really got bad when you had the Division kind of seeping into, and then the Division 2 seemingly not really going the distance, and now they're doing the Division Heartland. It all seems so messy and unfocused and full of things they've not fully supported and not successfully marketed and got out there. It's like they've decided they just want all of these entries in these various different business segments, and that's kind of like all they're doing. But what I want is like the next Assassin's Creed, and I feel like if we're going to get the next Assassin's Creed, what you need to do is something that captures people's imaginations like Watch Dogs did, but then actually deliver on it with an amazing game, not Watch Dogs. And I, I don't really know. There's the, there's the bit of me that I think is the optimist that would say, no, you got to listen to your creatives. You know, think about, like, what is the coolest setting you could make a game? Well, what is a setting or an idea for a game that just, you know, itself is is awesome and then build everything else out around that? Whereas a lot of the time, man, it just sort of feels like, hey, we want a bunch of free to play titles. We want a bunch of games of this business model. Ugh. I mean, I know that's obviously a gross oversimplification of however things work at that company. But uh, you do look at their output and think, man, some of this is so un uninspired. It, it, there is absolutely no wonder why it has not resonated with players. So how do they get that spark back? Because as far as them as a games publisher goes, if we're going to measure it just by the games, that's what they need. They need their spark back. The spark that lets the uh, the Mario plus Rabbit games uh, be so good, that lets Assassin's Creed, you know, at, at best, uh, feel like a, you know, a little love letter to historical settings. That's that's what the be that's the best of what Ubisoft could be, what they should be, and I think when they do their best, that's what they are. But it seems that they are lost in the business mires, and they're really struggling to emerge from the open world game sort of massively homogenized Ubisoft soup into something that can capture people's imaginations with new IPs and new projects. Honestly, I think they just need focus. How do you get focus organizationally when you have so many studios spread across the world that are having to work in these humongous co-productions? I don't know, but it seems like a bit of a nightmare. I don't think we can say Ubisoft are anywhere near best. I don't think they're worst, but as the series goes on, I'm realizing that this is probably going to end up being a tier list. A tier list that's pretty sparsely populated as we move to the top, because a lot of the big companies are making a lot of mistakes. What do you think so far? Let me know down below. I'll see you next time.